Um, let me uh, take a moment now to uh, introduce our, our keynote speaker. And uh, I'm really delighted to have uh, uh, one of the smartest, most interesting people at MIT uh, joining us here today. It's one of the real pleasures of being at a place like MIT that you have uh, these fun, interesting uh, people. And it's especially uh, beneficial when they uh, teach you that you're wrong. And that's what uh, our next speaker did. Uh, when Andy and I wrote our book in the second machine age, uh, we talked about some of the things that machines could do well and some of the things that machines couldn't do particularly well. And, and it was clear to us that routine information processing, data analysis, um, crunching numbers, uh, repetitive work, those are kinds of things that machines could do well. And we held out hope that there were a number of things that humans had a big advantage. And some of them were the way that uh, uh, connecting emotionally to each other and the kinds of uh, uh, interpersonal skills that people have with each other. Uh, but our next speaker's been doing some work on automotive uh, uh, robots, and she's got a, a company. Uh, uh, I think it's going to be about a $100 million company soon uh, with a product coming out in the fall called Jibo that's um, showing that uh, machines can connect to people in emotional ways that uh, I wouldn't have thought possible before. Uh, she's uh, a professor at the uh, uh, MIT Media Lab. She's written over 100 scientific paper. She's got a long list of awards, which I don't want to uh, tell you all about right now because I want to leave the time for her to speak. So please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Cynthia Brazil. Welcome, Cynthia. Thank you. All right, I need a clicker. This looks like what I need. So thank you so much, Eric. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you today. Um, I thought it would be fun to tell you a little bit of the story that I've been going through in terms of starting as a professor here at MIT uh, in the early 2000s, developing a new technology called social robotics, and then seeing this journey come into the world. And it's, I think, a great intersection, a great example of how the digital world is clearly impacting the physical world. And I think robotics is a great example of that. So can I advance? Yep. So we're going to talk about robots, right? And just to recognize that we, as human beings, have had thousands, in fact, we go back to our myths and legends, thousands of years fascination with this kind of technology. It's on our science fiction, our myths, our legends, long before we could actually build these machines. We've been imagining them. And in many ways, they've been used as a sort of philosophical mirror to think about our own humanity and what it is to be human. Now, when we think about how robotics has entered uh, the real world commercializations, of course, we're familiar with robots in manufacturing. Um, we're starting to see these amazing surgical robots. Um, now, as they're getting more intelligent, we're starting to see autonomous driving cars. Um, and of course, we're seeing the more AI side coming out in products like Alexa or OK Google or Cortana or Siri, where now these technologies can talk to us, where technologies are being able to recognize objects, recognize faces, being able to take on more of these attributes that uh, were really more about what only people could do. So this line is getting blurred more and more, and uh, it's continuing to advance at what, certainly for me being in the field right now, feels like an accelerating pace. Um, so I've read and I've been very uh, uh, inspired by the work of, of Angie and, and Eric and their book, The Second Machine Age, because it has really helped me kind of put my own work into this broader perspective. So they talk about the second machine age and the drivers, right? So one, of course, is this continued improvement, exponential improvement of digital technologies. Robotics is certainly taking advantage of that. So as sensors, as communications, as computation continues to get more and more powerful, we're able to put these, of course, into all kinds of artifacts, including robots, to make them more capable, but of course at less and less cost. So now, you know, the possibility of a commercial robot that's actually quite capable is becoming possible. We know that as these technologies are getting uh, incorporated into not only digital surfaces, but again, these uh, smart objects, um, they're generating huge amounts of data. And this data has been fueling machine learning, which has, of course, been driving the intelligence and capabilities of these technologies as well. And what we're seeing is an interesting shift now where large corporations might spend, you know, hundreds of, you know, person years developing advanced capabilities like automatic speech recognition and building whole corporations around that, um, managing information and the like. But now they're starting to actually put these capabilities into platforms with APIs, 
which is really fueling this advancement of um, you know, uh, digital innovation around the recombination of these very advanced capabilities. So now lots of people can put these capabilities into their products and services. And certainly uh, robots are taking advantage of that as well and benefiting from that as well. So all of these things are happening. You can ask the question, are we hitting this kind of inflection point where we're going to see rapid, rapid, rapid proliferation of more and more intelligent, more and more capable machines? So we're entering now into this time where we not only have the internet of information, but in the internet of things, but the internet of things that can think and talk and communicate and sense, not only with you, but with each other. And that, of course, is, is changing the world we live in in a very profound way. So for me, I've spent my life in robotics. And we're sort of in this time where we have all the data and information in the cloud. We have you know, the internet of things happening in our homes and our workplaces. Our stuff is getting more intelligent. You have the people who are living, who are working in these environments. And I think that leaves a very fascinating question in terms of where does the robot fit in? Because in many ways, the robot is the betwixt and between sort of entity between the world of information, the world of smart stuff, and the world of people. And that's what I really want to talk about today is this very, I think, intriguing new kind of relationship we can have with our technologies and especially with, with robots and the social robots in particular. So a social robot is an autonomous robot um, that can interact and communicate with you in a more human-like way. So as we've been designing these technologies, what we find is you know, our human mind naturally wants to engage these entities not as kind of things that are governed by laws of physics, but actually as social entities like each other whose behavior is governed by internal mental states, thoughts, intents, desires, and so forth. People naturally, their minds want to kind of understand and interact with robots in this way. So it presents an intriguing opportunity to say, well, if that's the way people are naturally trying to make sense and interact with this kind of technology, how do you then in turn design technologies to support that? So my dissertation work here at MIT many years ago was really the first to explore this question of, we all know we want robots to be smart and intelligent and learn, but what does it mean for machines to be socially intelligent? What does it mean for robots to be emotionally intelligent? Because they're going to have to be if they're going to actually be able to collaborate with us and interact with us as part of our daily lives in a way that really matches our human competence. And so a lot of my research at MIT has been showing if you can design robots in this way, there's really intriguing properties about them in terms of the nature of the benefit they can provide to human beings. So I want to talk a little bit about that, um, a part of that research program. So robots, social robots can uh, perceive human social and emotional cues. We have always been deeply inspired by the field of developmental psychology and psychology for how do people do these sorts of amazing things that we do and how can we take inspiration from that to put those capabilities into machines. And one of the most fascinating things we've been studying is not only about this naturalness of interface, the ability to communicate through nonverbal cues as well as verbal cues. We know that human communication is dominated actually by our nonverbal channels, right? But then machines or technologies that can provide us with social support, with emotional support that feel much more like you're interacting with an ally than a tool that you're using. It's a very different paradigm. And then if this is a kind of ally that can actually build rapport with you and engage in these sort of processes of social psychology around persuasiveness and trust, how does that enhance and benefit teamwork? How does that make human robot teams, human technology teams more efficient, more capable? That's a lot of what we've been exploring. So again, it's kind of taking traditional AI, traditional robotics, but then putting this whole human-centered spin on it. So I call it social emotive AI, right? So this is other kind of aspects. And it's all about designing technologies that can really understand and actually treat people as people. And if you interact with robots in the real world, you know, often they don't know if you're a person versus a chair. You're just something to be navigated around, right? But human beings, we're, we're special entities in the world, right? We should have our technologies treat us and recognize as human beings as opposed to just other kinds of stuff that they just have to, to deal with. So, you know, when we think about the perceptual abilities of the machines, it's not just recognizing there's entities moving around in space, but it's who are you? Uh, what, what are you emoting? What's the social cues you're giving me? And how does that help the machine get an insight into your thoughts, beliefs, and intents so that it can predict and anticipate and support you better in the future, again, like a partner. When we think about learning, so much of learning today has been this kind of big data, crunching data, behind the scenes sort of learning. But as you bring these technologies into human environments, people are going to want to be able to shape the robot's behavior. They're going to want to be able to personalize the behavior of these machines to their lifestyle. Um, so the ability to actively teach these robots is, is really important. As, as we know, when we teach 
other entities like ourselves or even our pets, it's a very collaborative process. And so it's views, viewing the teaching learning process much more like tutelage, um, where the teacher shapes the robot's exploration, the robot provides cues as to what it understands to shape the subsequent instruction. And it's kind of virtuous cycle. We can show you can rapidly accelerate the t learning and the adapt adapt adaptability of the machine when you do that. Um, we look at social, uh, the expressive capabilities of the robot, right? So when you collaborate with someone, you have to get a mental model in terms of what that entity is, is thinking or likely to do next. And so much of that, again, is communicated by that other entity with us. So how robots can express in ways that are intuitive to us that don't have to even be exactly human, but human-like enough. They could be abstracted, almost like uh, the way we've learned from animation, um, that reveal these internal states of the robot that, again, we intuit to map to these human-like states, but again, it's all about support and communication and effective interaction. And then, of course, these relational aspects. How do you build rapport? How do you support teamwork? How do you anticipate and predict and interact as a collaborative partner rather than just as a tool? So what we've been finding, intriguingly, is this is a new kind of relationship. When you look at, you know, read the media, there's always this sort of assumption that when you create these technologies, you're trying to replace people. And what we're finding, of course, that's not what we're trying to do, but what we're seeing is people understand these kinds of technologies as a combination of familiar relationships. So there are aspects of these intelligent social robots that feel like you're interacting with a motivating ally. So beyond just providing with information, they can be designed to help inspire you, motivate you, tell you the right thing at the right time, more like you're having someone in your corner, again, rather than just a tool that you're using. There are certainly aspects of it being a connected tool. I mean, these are based on computational technologies. They can access the internet. They can do anything a flat screen device can do, certainly. There's nothing stopping them from that. But then intriguingly, there seems to be this other aspect of this sort of companion animal, this kind of attentive companion that's actually not human. And it turns out there's actually advantages of that because there's aspects of people feeling these social robots are not judgmental, which is really intriguing. They're ever patient. So again, it's kind of this new relationship that we're discovering and how people naturally are trying to conceptualize their kind of new relationship with this kind of, this kind of technology. So, and what we've been finding is when you design technologies, and I'd say we've been exploring it quite a lot in terms of robotics, but I think this extends far beyond robots. But if you appreciate, if you're trying to design a technology that really supports and enhances our human capability, you have to understand something deep about how people think and act and learn. And it's profoundly social, it's profoundly emotional, as well as cognitive. So the more that you can design technologies in this humanized way, and by humanized, I mean this sort of multi-dimensional way, it turns out people do better. So in order to validate this, we not only build robots and we program them with new AI techniques to give them new capabilities, we then put them head to head with other traditional interventions, maybe graphical avatars or voice interface systems or potentially even people, just to understand what is the benefit or what, are the, what is the difference in acting with this kind of social robotic technology versus what else is out there. So many, 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 many studies done across the entire field to really try to understand this new medium, so to speak. And I think one of the intriguing things that's come out is, you know, so much of robotics has been thought of be, about being a labor technology that helps you do useful stuff in the world, physical stuff. And what we're finding is that there's actually real value in the social emotional dimension of these technologies and supporting human behavior as well. So domains like safety, health, learning, and emotional connection with people you care about. You know, if you do these things better, you live better. You know, to, to reinforce what Eric was saying, it, this is about human flourishing. And it's a very different perspective when you think about the benefit of robots that actually contribute to human flourishing versus performing physical tasks in the world. But we're finding that this is actually a really intriguing opportunity. So we've designed things like driving assistants in the car that act as a sort of concierge. And we've compared it to just digital avatars versus even just a person sitting in the seat next to you. And we find that people actually drive safer. We've compared to uh, health coach, uh, designed health coach robots that could be like your personal health coach on your counter to help you manage a diet and exercise program, compared it to just a computer version of a coach with the same behavior versus being socially embodied like a social robot, or just logging systems, or a lot of apps do today. And we've looked at learning companion technologies. And you know, in the case of a learning companion technology for the child, it's a very social emotional process. So how can the robot interact with the child as a peer-like companion to foster discovery, to foster even pro-curious behavior? So we're finding this sort of social modeling component is a really important or intriguing aspect where children actually model the robot's behavior to propel their own learning and their own uh, more positive attitudes towards learning. And what we're seeing is that the robots keep doing better. Um, people do better with these robots when they have all of these attributes versus just being more and more abstracted aspects of these. So, you know, 
car driving robot, you actually drive safer. You make fewer mistakes. A healthcare robot, you actually are more adherent. You engage with it longer. You trust it more. You find its advice to be more credible. And in a learning companion robot, you actually see kids learn better and even attitude towards learning. So really, really fascinating stuff. So, you know, when you look at this work, then you kind of step back and you think about it. It's like this is a whole new way to think about robots, right? It's not, again, about robots that do physical tasks like the dominant view even today. It's about this other kind of relationship. And it's almost as if to say, you know, we've, we've designed these kind of robots where the main value proposition is around the ability to do physical work, things like backs around manipulation, things like autonomous driving cars. We see commercial entities, very kind of niche products like vacuum cleaners and lawnmowers, again, it's all about physical work. We've seen these entertainment robots that kind of do fun things and entertain us, but they don't do anything really useful. And then there's this whole other space, um, and this is where the company Jibo is going, which is to say social robots should be thought of not just as a sort of physical technology, but even as a new kind of medium for content. So when you think about health, education, entertainment, com communication, social robots are bringing this kind of content and information to life at a whole new way, at a deeper humanized engagement, that again provide benefits to you in ways that these other kinds of technologies don't. So thinking about Jiba now, thinking about social robots as actually a new platform for content is kind of the paradigm shift. So I'm going to shift now and talk a little bit about Jibo. So Jibo is a helpful companion robot. It's helpful, it actually helps you do real useful stuff, but it has this companion attentiveness side which feels more like a living presence. It can bring content to life in a whole new way with engagement and personalization that based on the science, actually helps you be more successful. And the company is basically the, the uh, entity that I founded in 2012 to bring this uh, to the world. And not only to bring Jibo as a product, as this new entity to the world, but as a developer platform. So as we talked about this importance of being able to harness the innovations, the digital recombinations of innovations, robots and other devices are clearly doing this as well. We live in the age of platform, and Jibo is absolutely a platform. As this well. is your house. So I'm going to show you a little video to put Jibo uh, into context. These are your things, but these are the things that matter. And somewhere in between is this guy. Introducing Jibo, the world's first family robot. Say hi, Jibo. Hi, Jibo. <laughs> Jibo helps everyone out throughout their day. He's the world's best cameraman. By intelligently tracking the action around him, he can independently take video and photos so that you can put down your camera and be a part of the scene. Jibo, take the picture. He's a hands-free helper. You can talk to him, and he'll talk to you back, so you don't have to skip a beat. Excuse me, Anne? Yes, Jibo. Melissa, just sent a reminder that she's picking you up in half an hour to go grocery shopping. Thanks, Jibo. He's an entertainer and educator. Through interactive applications, Jibo can teach. Let me in, or else I'll... Ha! And I'll... Ha! And I'll blow your house in! <laughs> hey, where'd you go? There you are. <laughs> He's the closest thing to a real-life teleportation device. He can turn and look at whoever you want with a simple tap of your finger. Check out my turkey dinner, Mom. I wish you wouldn't eat that hey. one. They make turkey pizza? I want turkey pizza. <laughs> and he's a platform, so his skills keep expanding. He'll be able to connect to your home. Welcome home, Eric. Hey, buddy. Can you order some takeout for me? Sure thing. Chinese, as usual? You know me so well. And even be a great wingman. You have a voice message from Ashley. Want to hear it? Absolutely. Hey, call me when you're home. Better make that takeoff for two, Jibo. We've dreamt of it for years, and now he's finally here. And he's not just an aluminum shell, nor is he just a three-axis motor system. He's not even just a connected device. He's one of the family. Jibo, this little bot of mine. All right, so that's Jibo. So I want to tell you a little bit about uh, 
the commercial this side now. Is your I can get past the video. So um, Jibo is a VC-backed venture. And of course, whenever you're trying to raise venture capital for a new venture, especially like this, which is an unproven category, are people ready for it? What's the price point? There are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of challenges to be met. So we started raising uh, money for the Series A in 2014. And you know, uh, crowdfunding had become kind of the, the real metric of being able to put a hardware-based product out there, a consumer play out there, and have people basically vote with their pocketbook by making contributions to back your campaign to show that people are actually ready for this kind of technology in the home. So uh, we did an Indiegogo campaign in the summer of 2014 um, having no idea if we were going to be successful at all, as you can imagine, because of all of these, you know, is it too soon, is it too expensive, and, 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 and the like. But it turned out we did incredibly successful. So that video that you saw was one of the big drivers of our campaign. Um, it drove traffic onto our uh, own website as well as the Indiegogo, but it, to date it has over 10 million hits, so it went viral. That was a huge part of it. Um, it, was, it ended up being the most successful uh, technology uh, Indiegogo campaign at the time. Um, we've raised almost $4 million uh, as validation for this concept. Um, and we successfully raised a first round, uh, a Series A at, at $25 million, and we have now strategic partners um, to help bring Jibo uh, to Asia for additional investment. So this was quite a wi wild ride. I think you know, the role of uh, crowdfunding platforms like Indiegogo, are, are, it's been an intriguing twist in terms of how concepts and products like this actually get a chance to, to get funded in, in, in our crazy world. Jibo has a number of core platform pillars. So, you know, we live in a time where there are many, many platforms, there are many, many competitors. You know, when we did this campaign in 2014, later that year, Alexa came out, right? And of course, Jibo's not a direct competitor with Alexa, but it was sort of this question in terms of uh, how is the space shaping up of a shared device in the family that can be interacted with with spoken text? Because before that, everybody assumed your smartphone was going to be your interface to everything. And now suddenly there was this different kind of paradigm. So it turned out Alexa was hugely validating um, of this market. And now you just heard yesterday Google announced Google Home, which is a direct competitor to Alexa. So the space is very frothy right now. Alexa sold about 3 million units. So again, just really validating that this is a new thing. And so how Jibo fits in there becomes an intriguing point because we're not a Google, we're not an Amazon. So we have to show that we're highly differentiated in not only what Jibo can do for you, Jibo has a screen and cameras and things like that, so it can physically do things differently than something that's an only you know, a talking speaker. But the experience is also fundamentally different. And the question of how do we support developers in creating that experience is also critical. So Jibo has this rich multimodal sensing capability, and that's a lot of what our own engineers build into the platform so that people can be just web developers, app developers using JavaScript. They don't have to be an expert in robotics, but they get all of the power and the intelligence of the platform that they can put into their apps and services. So rich multimodal sensing, speech recognition, sound localization, uh, vision capabilities. Um, there is, of course, a lot of the expressive capabilities that Jiba supports. There's tools to allow uh, people to create their own animations, but there's a rich library of existing animations and behaviors that they can build upon. Um, so how you support this rich interaction, the ability to engage in the right kinds of learning for personalization, all of these are capabilities that we provide to developers. And then, of course, Jibo is connected to the cloud. Um, and it's a platform, again, so that you can create skills, and they can go in the Jibo skill store, and so much like Android or iOS. That's the model for Jibo. So when we did our crowdfunding campaign, as you can see in the video, we saw Jibo as a whole family. We, we, and we, we, we called Jibo the world's first family robot for a reason, not a home robot, but a family robot, because we really wanted to focus it around the people and not the stuff. Right, but the big kind of areas that we saw real traction was that the main purchaser is sort of what we call the family conductor. They're, you know, it often in a, well, they must be in a, a, a Wi-Fi connected house with broadband. If you have broadband in your home, chances are you have multiple iPads, computers, devices, smartphones. So Jibo is really fitting into that market. There's a main buyer called the family conductor uh, who may then buy not only for themselves, but perhaps for an aging parent and looking at aging place applications, perhaps because they're intrigued in the connected home and Jibo becomes this very easy interface to the stuff around you. Um, new parents is potentially a market. When you think about Jibo's ability to be an advanced kind of baby monitored content, remind you of well visits and so forth, skills around pediatrics are an intriguing opportunity. And then just families in general with children. So kids love Jibo. I can't tell you how many Adults have come up to me to tell me the reason why they learned about Jibo is because their children saw Jibo on the internet and now they won't 
be quiet about it, they want Chiba. So learning, play, I mean, all of that. Family play in this new way. You know, I think one of the zeitgeist of Jibo is with these flat screens coming into the home, it's almost as if, you know, it's a technology that's not just a personal technology, it's an individual technology that takes your full attention at the expense of shutting out the people around you. But Jibo as a social robot can turn and look and have this multi-party engagement. So even though you can still do the dishes and walk around and talk to your kids and you talk to Jibo, it feels like a group interaction. It's a very different paradigm for technology in the home. So I want to just take a few uh, remaining minutes, again, to kind of punch what is so different about Jibo. Again, you can let your mind run wild in terms of all the skills that you could develop for Jibo. Again, anything you have on a tablet, potentially, you could put on Jibo. So food ordering, recipes, you name it. But the big differentiator, of course, then comes into this experiential component, right? And it's so different from Alexa and Google Home and those kinds of other devices because of this. So Jibo, um, we talk about Jibo not just being a persona, like a transactional information assistant like Google and so forth that just sit there and do one shot answers to questions. Jibo actually is taking a lot of inspiration from the world of animation. He's a character. So there's this whole other dimension of how you create this sort of living character experience in the home, which of course has the opportunity for a lot of fun and delight and playfulness, as well as coupling it with the utility. So, oh, what? so one of the re intriguing things about Jibo is there's this kind of this combination of the kind of history of thinking about this autonomous robot that's very functional or kind of, again, the series or the Gratanas or OK Googles of the world. They can sense, they can think, they can act, they can learn, they can be autonomous. But then there's also this question of believability, right? It's this kind of fun, animated aspect of what does it mean to bring this other kind of entertainment experience in the home. And really combining this both into a helpful companion is, is Jibo. Aspects of how does he feel alive, not kind of like a finite state machine wind up thing, but something that has that presence, that physical presence, that animate presence, is a big part of the experience we're trying to create. So I just want to show you a little quick video clip that kind of illustrates that. So these are obviously three Jibos just sitting on a table. I want you to notice how when I come in, they each behave a little differently. Hey, Jibo. Hey, Cynthia. Hey, how are you guys doing? <laughs> so again, it just feels more like a little buddy in the home versus just this black thing that's sitting on your counter. Okay. Um, when we talk about bringing content to life, you know, when we talk to our developers, you know, we, we have these principles hey, that we, we, we talk about in terms of, think about the gestalt of the performance. What's your favorite movie? <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite, too. Right, so just appreciate it. He doesn't have to say things to communicate, right? The fact that when he, you know, there's screens that display, but Jibo's more almost like a theatrical experience. He performs, you know, and his eye is kind of this morphable, shape-shiftable element that can turn into a whole bunch of things. And because of that, I mean, you can be, you can be kind of cheeky and witty and fun and clever about how Jibo expresses things to you. It doesn't have to be all based on just a spoken, spoken language interface, which actually I think in time can become quite cumbersome if not stale, right? but adding these other dimensions of expertivity just add fun and level to, levity as well as functionality um, to how Jibo interacts with you. And then I want to show one more uh, example, hey, which is around this notion of helpfulness, right? So you want Jibo to be a helpful robot. There's a lot of attributes that go into that. So this notion of partnership, doing something together with Jibo, not just a one-shot encounter, but being able to do a multi-step interaction to get something done. You know, being able to have Jibo proactively anticipate things, being able to help repair mistakes in a quick, effortless way, because mistakes are obviously made with any of these devices. And, you know, I love the idea of Jibo in, in those acts of wanting to be helpful and anticipating, being interpreted as these kinds of thoughtful acts, right? So I want to show these kind of incorporated in a little uh, interaction around something like ordering a pizza, <laughs> but you can kind of see them all come to life. Hey, Jibo. I want to order a pizza. Sure. What would you like? I want a small, no, large pepperoni and olives. Look okay? No, I want a large. My bad. 
How is this? Yeah, looks good. Is Nathan joining? Um, yeah, he is. Remember, he's allergic to olives. Oh, cancel the olives. Ready to order? Yeah, ship it. Thanks, Jibo. So again, that's kind of a, it, it's a, it's a concept piece, but it's the kind of interaction that we're designing uh, Jibo to support and that, the kind of style and feel of interaction we're encouraging our, our developers to think about when they create for Jibo that will really distinguish it from the other kinds of home digital assistant experiences that you're seeing today. So um, with that, um, hey, Jibo. Oops. I'm going to wrap up. So our vision, of course, is a Jibo, or social robot in every home. Um, and again, it's really about Jibos helping you do what you want and need to do, but in a fundamentally different way, in a much more humanized way that I feel is going to be much better experience for, for the family and even the extended family when we think about caring for an aging parent. And it's also a powerful vehicle for creativity and the imagination. And you know, one of the most rewarding things that I've seen is developers engaging us through our, our media channels and talking about all the wonderful things they want to see Jibo too and just showing how they get what makes Jibo so different. Um, and he's going to be shipping later this year. And you can learn more about Jibo at Jibo.com. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to, yeah, you call me. Um, having navigated several individuals in their later years of the healthcare system, being the note taker, being the cheerleader, being the coach, all of that, have you thought about the role of Jibo as a patient care advocate oh, yeah. for the 77 million who yes. were? Yeah, yeah, so, you know, in general, one of the big um, use cases uh, of people who saw the campaign and approached to us was exactly that people around chronic disease issues aging in place. Um, they see huge potential for this humanized engagement around that because they're just, there's not enough doctors, there's not enough care providers, tremendous stress on the family. So if you can have another part of your team, your care team there and helping to support, um, huge potential for that. So for us, again, as a platform company, we want to support experts, people who want to you know, develop skills for Jibo for that domain where they see Jibo as a really differentiated value add over flat screens and so forth. Um, but we wouldn't be the ones necessarily creating that ourselves. We would want to enable and create partnerships. But we're, we're getting you know, connections from the outside world, especially in those kinds of domains, yeah. You want to choose? Yep. Uh, how about over here? I love the idea of social robots. But at the same time, I share some of the concerns of Gates, Musk, Hawking, mm. about the longer term future of AI. Mm. I'm sure you're thinking about this. What is your point of view? So, I mean, I think my point of view, and I think you can see this from my whole research program, the problem to be solved here is how you design technologies that can work in a deep partnership and collaboration with people. And so much of what I do here is really thinking about how technologies can even support human flourishing, you know, beyond kind of the productivity standard things that people talk about. You can see from a lot of the applications I've done, even as a professor, all, all around helping people feel that they're more successful. So, and especially when they come to areas of transformation, right? So if you learn something new, you're transformed. Your opportunities beyond that are different, right? If you can stay healthier, your life is transformed. You know, you're just able to do things that you couldn't do otherwise. So I think you know, my philosophical stance is really how can we create much more humanistic technologies that really help support human flourishing in new ways? And I feel that's a question that not enough people are really explicitly considering. I think a lot of the applications are still kind of more traditional ones. But this is basically saying if you create technologies in the right way that are deeply informed by the human experience and things we care deeply about for ourselves and for our families, these technologies can play a profound role in helping people be successful in those areas too. So um, you know, as an innovator, as a scientist, it's about presenting evidence and, and opening those possibilities to people's minds to say, this is how we should be thinking about the problem. Uh, I'll go, oh, Don, I'll choose Don. <laughs> a friend of mine who lives in Phoenix uh, was visiting this weekend and we had long, and we 
we had a lot of conversation about Jibo, and he wants to become a developer. Mm. Is that a possibility for him in Phoenix mm -hmm. uh, to get involved? Yeah, absolutely. So and he, yep. What are the steps for doing that? Yeah, so he can just go to the website, and there's a whole developer portal yep. that he can go on to, and he can get the SDK, and there's a virtual Jibo simulator, and he can start doing the simulation, and then the hardware will come later this year. But yeah, he can start getting involved soon. One yeah, last right. Question. One last question. Okay, back here. Thank you. What a tremendous design. Given the battle for the home, right, mm. Google and others, given that you've got something that is so appealing, mm. where do you go with this? Who doesn't want it, right? What a, what a problem. Well, you know, so I would love, I would love for that to be the case. Who wouldn't want Jibo, <laughs> you know? But, but you know, we're, we're, we're this startup, <laughs> you know, with the juggernaut. So, again, I mean, we have to. We have to be so, we have to be so different. We have to offer such a different experience that if you're a person who wants this kind of experience of technology in the home, of course you're gonna, of course you're gonna want to get Jibo. Now Jibo is gonna be, we haven't set the formal public price yet, but it's gonna be basically the price of a of a high-end tablet. So it's gonna be more expensive than an Alexa or or an Echo or a, a Google Home. I don't know what the Google Home price is, but I'm assuming they must be targeting around Alexa. So you know there is gonna be a challenge there in terms of. Is the experience and the utility of Jibo, you know, positioned such that you know, you want you'll pay the extra money for this kind of experience? If you just want the utility, then I think you know that market would want the Alexa. But if you really want this fundamentally different experience of technology and how it engages the family, I think you're going to definitely want Jibo. But um, yeah, I mean, it's it's frothy. It's a frothy space right now. So it's a it's you know it's a race. We're in a race. So, so when exactly can we start buying them? So um, I believe in June the site will start taking pre-orders again, and then they'll be shipping in the like fall time frame. So it's later this year, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, we're targeting obviously Christmas. So, so yes, under the tree. Thank you very much. Congratulations. <laughs> Great, thank you.